All right, we are now live for July's um, AMA, that's Ask Me Anything session. Uh, hopefully everybody's hearing things coming through quite well. I uh, got everything set up here with my coffee. I see a number of uh, questions already in the chat. Let me fix it so that it's live chat rather than just top chat. And it looks like a lot of people have ad added like three or four questions. So I'm going to take one from each person rather than going through them sequentially um, in order to be, be fair about things. So let's see, Ken Hines has three questions up, uh, actually four at the start. I'm gonna take one of them. Um, so I'll, I'll actually take only part of one of them. I'll take part of his first one. Who are five contemporary living philosophers that I think are saying something compelling and important or whose work is significant and could you summarize why you think they're important uh, it might this might be a little short on the summarization part so um, I'll say right off the bat you know most of these are going to be people in virtue ethics because that's that's where I do a, a good bit of my my work um, or in moral philosophy so that's you know and they're people who I, I tend to, to read so uh, to begin with, let, let's you know say Alistair McIntyre, still alive. Uh, he's going to be turning 90. I think either he is at 90 already or is he's turning 90. There's a conference for him down in Notre Dame commemorating that, which unfortunately I can't get to because of all my work obligations, but I'd love to be there for that. Uh, still, you know, brilliant and, and very important uh, thinker. Um, somebody else who I've had the, the good fortune to also be uh, engaged with, who, who I like quite a bit also as a person, is Christopher Gill. He's got a new book out on uh, the self and Hellenistic philosophy. Uh, very important, uh, somewhat understated uh, character in, in the, the field of, of ancient philosophy. So he's not, he's not as old as McIntyre by any means, um, but he is a senior scholar. Um, who else would I put in there? I mean, most of the people that I'm picking are all at the senior scholar stage. Um, Julia Annis is, is another one. She's got a lot of great books and articles out on uh, ancient philosophy and philosophy as a way of life, um, although she doesn't usually phrase it like that, but she is doing that in the process, which, by the way, so is Chris Gill, and uh, so is Alistair McIntyre. Um who else do I would I direct your your attention towards? Um, somebody who's a bit younger, who's doing um, quite a bit of work uh, here and there. A lot of it in terms of translations. Margaret Graver, um, she's got a really wonderful book on Stoicism and emotion out that I think everybody should should take a look at. And then. Um, uh, who else am I engaging with quite a bit? You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this business ethics class online, and so I've actually been reading a lot of uh, Robert Audi, <laughs> of all people. Um, somebody who's, you know, very, very smart. And again, older scholar, made a lot of contributions all across the field. Um, so those would be five people uh, well worth checking out. Uh, cringe. Favorite film adaptation of a book? That's that's tough because sometimes I watch a movie and I don't actually realize that it was a book in the first place. Here, I got to get a little bit more light going in this area. Um, so, yeah, that's a good good question. Favorite? Um, I would guess that um, you know maybe. Uh, I think the Duelists was in fact uh, a not a is it a book? Yeah, it's because it's based on, on on Pushkin, right? And um, I think it is based on Pushkin. But the the Ridley Scott movie, The Duelist, one of my favorite movies of all time. Just gorgeous sets, landscapes, beautiful soundtrack, great story, great acting. Um, I would I would check that out. Uh, let's see here. Oh, this is a, this is a good one. Um, Junatan Nogisto, I heard a professor very confidently assert that there is really no theory of the forms in Plato. It was superimposed by later thinkers. How justified is this claim? Uh, well, if you read Plato, not justified at all. <laughs> I mean, you, you'd have to throw out everything from 
you know, the Fado and the Republic forward, wouldn't you? Because it's very clear that there are forms in Plato. I mean, it's mentioned as such, and it shows up in dialogue after dialogue. Now, you could say that there's no theory of the forms as such in earlier dialogues, depending on, you know, the chronology that you, you accept. Um, but that's a, um, I mean, that's a laughable claim. I don't know why your professor would make that. That's the sort of thing that cranks say. Sort of like the people who are, who are like, you know, Jesus Christ never existed. Or, you know, Socrates never existed. We have no historical evidence for them. And you're like, come on. You know, uh, it's one thing to say maybe this character wasn't precisely like what they're being presented as and talk about, you know, uh, you know, reconstructions later on. But it, it's a whole nother thing to make these sweeping bombastic claims. I mean, what evidence would there be that later thinkers created the theory of the forms, right? That's another problem with these, these claims that, oh, I've got the, the secret teaching and I know more than everybody else. Usually they're, they're not based in any, any good evidence that doesn't require you to buy into uh, half of the conspiracy theory to begin with. Shaf Ali Khan, what is one of the most convincing arguments in your opinion for and against the existence of God? Well, I don't think people are usually convinced by arguments just by themselves. There are always arguments within a context, um, which might, you know, for a lot of people who are like the, you know, reason logic types, um, this, well, that's no good, you know? Well, that's the way people are actually convinced of nearly everything in their life. So I, I actually think the ontological argument as provided by Anselm is pretty good. Um, as it's reformulated in, say, Spinoza or the 20th century people that are writing about it and trying to turn it into, you know, perfect being theology or something like that, I, I think it's a whole different ballgame. But the unum argumentum isn't just proving that God exists, it's proving all these other things as well. And it requires you to sort of like go into it. Um, and I, I find it, you know, most of the time, I mean, I go back and forth, I've talked about this many times before, uh, uh, I go back and forth quite a bit, but uh, so have many other, you know, I won't place myself in the rank of great thinkers, but some great thinkers who've thought about the argument have also gone back and forth like that as well. All right, uh, Piggy Pig Pig. I just read Sartre's Nausea. At the end of the book, the self-taught man turns out to be a, a pedophile. Why did Sartre do that? Is it to show all people have a dark side? Um, I don't know. You know, I... I there may be some bit of information out there that I'm not uh, privy to where Sartre actually talks about the motivations for, for doing that. I think it's the self-taught man is, is a, sort of a, a humanist, and Sartre is attacking a certain kind of humanism, um, and he's trying to show, it, you know, he could, have, he could have been all sorts of things other than a pedophile. So he's, he's trying to show that the, uh, in, in that character that, um, many people who put on a mask of, of humanism are actually kind of bastards deep down inside. And, and um, you know, so are many of the people who criticize humanism as well, if we, if we want to go there, too. Um, all right, I'm going to scroll down and find some things by other people asking questions. And maybe we'll come back to some of the, the other questions that piled up before. But generally, it's, it's good to ask a question. I'll get to your question, but you can't ask like eight in, in a row or something. All right. Um, let's see. So the next person in line would be um, John Gohenka. If I remember correctly, David, Ch David Chalmers said somewhere he hadn't read that much Kant, which is interesting for someone who is basically the consciousness guy. I don't know that Chalmers is the consciousness guy. I'll admit I've read very little Chalmers and I've read a lot about consciousness. So, you know, uh, and, and when it comes down to it, so the bigger general point, when it comes down to it, um, nobody can read everything that's out there and you can't even read more than just a, a small part of what's out there. And if you want to really specialize, you know, meaning go deep into something, it's, it's very rare that you find people who are more than one trick ponies. Um, so, you know, I mean, I read Kant, but I, I read Kant sometimes because I enjoy his stuff and sometimes because I'm going to teach it. Um, but I'm not, I'm definitely not a Kantian. And, um, you know, I'm not going to say that, that Chalmers, his work isn't, you know, uh, adequately taking consciousness into to account because he hasn't read much Kant. 
Uh, maybe he's read other people. I don't, I don't know. I don't. I haven't read enough Chalmers to actually know. Um, I can tell you that that quite often there are philosophers who are, are set back a bit by not reading people. Um, I've pointed some things out like that over the years. Where, for for example, in analytic, uh, um, what do they call that now? It's a virtue epistemology, right? There's this whole realm of virtue epistemology. A lot of what they're doing is rehashing things from the ancients and, and medievals without realizing it. And they're also not, not grasping, because they don't read these people, that say phenomenologists of value might have something to do with it, or people in the critical thinking movement might have something to do with it. And usually there's, there's two responses when, when you point this out. Um, one response is sort of the generous response, and they're like, oh yeah, they're doing something interesting. I wish I had the time to look into them, because um, we're all you know, pretty busy people once we get you know careers and get going. Graduate school, it's a whole different ballgame. You got tons and tons of time to do what you want there. But of course you have no money and you have, you know, anxieties about your prospects. So that that, you know, and you may have to work a job too. Uh, but not a job like like later on. Um, the other response is like, oh well we don't care. We're gonna, you know, close off our thing. And you get that response sometimes too. Um, but more often than not, in my experience, and it could just be how I approach people, I usually get the, I much more often get the, oh, that's that's interesting that so-and-so is doing that, the more, uh, you could call it respect for pluralism re response in philosophy. All right, um, let's see, zero, foy, five, what do you play to Aristotle about wrong due to them being some of the earliest recorded philosophers in effect and later philosophers by them starting off with those ideas? Oh, okay, I, I see what you're asking. So what things do I think that Plato and Aristotle not only got wrong, but then it established sort of a precedent for, for later stuff. Um, I mean, Aristotle's got a glaring problem with, uh, you know, women, slaves, barbarians, uh, not being capable of full rationality, right? And this goes away in later thinkers because almost all the later thinkers are barbarians by Aristotle's standard, right? Very few of them are actually Greeks from, from Greece or Ionia or, or perhaps Macedonia would get thrown in there, right? Because Aristotle himself is from there. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the, the stuff about women, which Plato, by the way, didn't fall into. Read Plato's Republic, right? Women have the same capacities as men do, um, same capacities for rationality, for thumos, for emotions, all those sorts of things. Um, Aristotle's attitude went on for, for quite a while. So that, that would be one example. Um, and you see, you know, somebody like Mary Wollstonecraft having to criticize her own, you know, contemporaries like, like you know, Rousseau and Burke and uh, people of, of that time. She doesn't spend all that much time on Aristotle, but, but it's sort of part of the, the culture for a long time. Um, I mean, what other mistakes, you know, um, you know the, the the cosmology and and um, physics that that Aristotle has, which is not unique to Aristotle. I mean, you see similar things in the Stoics. You see similar things uh, probably if we had Epicurus's um, uh, on nature, we'd see a lot of similar stuff in there as well. You know, um, but those are you know those are things that. They, they did their best attempts at, at understanding the cosmos that they live in and its relation to us human beings. And then it was later outmoded by better science. So, you know, um, there, there's quite a bit of that. If you buy into Heidegger, right, you've got this epochal metaphysics and, you know, Plato represents one kind of turning away from pre-Socratic philosophers and their insights about truth as, as revealing, which is more Heidegger than, than, than those, you know, ancient philosophers, I would say. Heidegger is telling a story where he's sort of the central figure in it, right? Um, I mean, Nietzsche also has some things to say about that too, right? So Plato and Aristotle... Plato, I mean, Nietzsche has a sort of, Nietzsche's got an interesting attitude towards Plato. Platonism, he doesn't like, you know, theory of the forms, you know, all of that sort of stuff, but that's because it's very Socratic. He credits Plato as a poet, as, as being in this tragic situation where he's, you know, essentially Greek literature is, is burned itself out in Euripides 
and later tragedy, people like Agathon and the, the new comedy, and, and Plato cobbles together a new art form, the Platonic dialogue. Um, <coughs> but I mean, that's yeah, sort of a rambling answer to that. All right, uh, Nazim to Jada. Uh, do I think a nation state and enforced borders are inherently oppressive or immoral? Um, no, they're not inherently oppressive or immoral, but you're going to be hard pressed to find border crossings where uh, sooner or later somebody doesn't make it oppressive, right? And something could be oppressive without being necessarily immoral, you know. Um, I think that, that nation states do, in fact, have a legitimate need for security, um, very often <clears throat> that winds up turning into a security mentality. Uh, you know, we, we notice that, for example, in our own border guards in the South, there's this very, very nasty, virulent racism that's been there for a very long time that doesn't just have to do with race, it has to do with exercise of power against um, people that, that you can abuse with lar largely with impunity. And it's not just this current administration, although this, this administration has severely worsened it. It's sort of like there was already uh, a, you know, a, a disease there and this administration took away all the possible medicine and you know, added a whole bunch of crap to the system to make the disease worse on purpose, um, I would say. Um, just you know, for the sake, of, as some commentators are pointing out, cruelty is the, the motive behind it. Cruelty, uh, especially of, of the people who are drawn to that sort of mentality. But it was there to begin with. You know, the previous administrations had, had done that as well. Um, I was, you know, I remember driving to to uh, Toronto from New York um, and getting to the border. And you, you know, you used to be crossing the border to Canada was a nothing, right? And we got pulled off and questioned and all that. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? And now what I was going through was just teeny, teeny, teeny little inconvenience and, you know, suspicion and stuff like that compared to what a lot of people go through at so many other borders. So, um, you know, we can think about how can we make this fair? How can we make this better? How can we make this um, less immoral? But y you do have to have some controls. It can't just be, hey, anybody goes wherever the hell they want. You know, that's not going to work. So, all right. Um, let's see what we got here. Zorba, um, what's the future of philosophy since less students are choosing it as a career? I don't know that less students are choosing it as a, a career. Do you mean less students are majoring in philosophy? We probably have to look at the stats on that. And that's probably going to be from country to country to country. I'm not sure where you're based, but here in America, we still have plenty of philosophy majors in part because, you know, they, they get hired. You know, philosophy majors generally tend to score highest on the uh, LSATs that prep you for law school, um, higher than, you know, the pre-law students or the poli-sci students. Um, you know, they, they get jobs in, in businesses that want people, along with other people in the humanities, that want people who can actually write a memo, read a memo, make an argument, carry out an analysis that unfortunately the business people and the hard science people often aren't being, uh, and especially the communications people aren't, aren't learning how to do. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that, that the premise is actually true. I think that, um, you know, there's certainly less academic positions in philosophy or many of the academic positions that are available are not ones that are that are really sustainable for a person who wants to earn a living um, solely by being a college professor. But um, I don't actually see that as a bad thing. You know, I've been outside of the traditional academy, although still teaching here and there for almost 10 years now. And I, I chose granted, I, I, I did it, you know, so that I could be with my now wife uh, living in the same place, but I, I chose to uh, leave a uh, position where I was up for early tenure and promotion, and I'd moved into administration and was being groomed to actually run a tenure quality enhancement plan process. Um, and I did that in part because I thought, well, you can't actually live outside of the academy. Um, and and that's that's where things are going to go, and and that'll be, you know, reversion to the norm. You think that in in most of, of history, we had all sorts of philosophy professors? No, we, we had them where there were universities, and uh, a lot of people did philosophy sort of on the side. Machiavelli is a great example, right? He had a day job, 
even Descartes, who did teach in a university for a short time, he, he's, you know, doing what he's doing on his own, mostly science, actually, not philosophy so much. Hume made a living. Uh, he never got an academic position that he wanted. He, he made his living writing history and uh, literary criticism. So, you know, there, it, it's quite possible to conduct yourself in philosophy without having to, you know, select the academy. All right. Um, let's see here. Oop, just skipped a little bit. Okay. Um, Anonymous 101 asks, I would like to hear your thoughts about the Austrian School of Economics. What do you disagree with them on or agree with them on? I think they're very reductionist. Um, that's, that's pretty much all I need to say about that. And, and the people who are like big on them, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you've got, you've got, this is very often the case, you got the thinkers and then they're fans. And almost anytime somebody brings up Austrian School of Economics, I, I, I'm like rolling my eyes slightly inside of my head thinking, oh, great, more of this, you know? Um, because the people who tend to be super fans usually are, are hardcore libertarians that frame, frame themselves as classical liberals and um, are, are very adamant about the need to like, you know, uh, change, change our, our structure to have, you know, more deregulation and, and more market forces. And, and you know, I, I think that, you know, if, if this is going to continue, we, I mean, it's not like we don't have institutions and think tanks out there already pushing this stuff all the time. Cato Institute is a great example, you know. Um, you're gonna find plenty of people uh, really big on that in, in there. So um, that's probably enough about that one. Um, oh, nice. Retro Gamer 71. Thanks. Continuing to enjoy your work immensely. Hope you can cover John Henry Newman's taxonomy of the concept in his grammar of a sentence on possible future. <laughs> Are we doing possible world semantics now with the possible future? Um, in, in, you know, in some world, I'm already covering it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't help you because you can't get YouTube videos from that other possible world. Imagine if uh, that we're, I'm going to all answer the thing in a minute, but let's go off on a riff about that. Imagine, you know, per sci-fi hypotheses that we actually did have um, what uh, Rick and Morty were calling transdimensional cable, right? Uh, and that we could tune into it through YouTube. Now it would make, um, it would make you know classification of things really tough. You'd have to figure out exactly what dimension or what possible world things are coming from. Um, but you know, it would certainly widen. It, it would it would solve my problem of saying you know I should have done videos on this a while ago. I wish I'd gotten to them. I would just like you know find the Greg who actually did those videos and then, and then copy them. And because I'm you know so reasonable, I wouldn't get you know too defensive with myself. I would you know send an email to myself in that in that in a world and say listen. I know that you know you did the videos on Newman a while back. Do you think I could have the downloads of them so I could upload them into my channel so I don't have to shoot them myself? And the the very reasonable Greg over there would say, "Yeah, that's that's fine. You know, so long as you know you're not going to encroach on on my channel over here, uh, doesn't you know it's perfectly fine." <laughs> You know, and then what, what could I have from your side, you know? And of course, there'd probably be like some Greg, because we're talking about like every possible outcome. There'd be some Greg who was a total slacker who'd only shot like maybe one or two videos by this point, right? He wouldn't, I don't know that we'd actually trade with that guy, but, you know, the rest of us would maybe form a consortium. I should, you know, actually write that up as a story. That could be kind of an interesting science fiction story. So John Henry Newman, it's been a while since I've, I've been reading him. Read them a lot back in, in the early 2000s as I was doing my dissertation on Blondell, who was um, certainly in, in, you could say, not, not so much influenced by Newman in the sense of drawing ideas directly from him, but um, they were all in that same current. And so, yeah, Newman is an interesting guy. Um, I actually have, have a few friends who are in the, the, I think it's the John Henry Newman Society, and they get together and have conferences every year. And I've never been able to go. I always thought it would be kind of fun to do that. So yeah, definitely. I mean, so those of you who aren't privy to what retro gamers talking about, right? John Henry Newman was a 
um, British, you could call him, I guess the best word for him is theologian, but he's also really a philosopher as well. Educational theorist, communications theorist, um, really interesting guy. Um, starts out as an Anglican, makes his way into the, to the Roman Catholic Church. Um, if you if you ever go to like college campuses in the United States and you see a Newman Center, that's named after John Henry Newman, right? Um, the Newman Center is a place for for Catholic students to go in secular universities. So really, yeah, it's a, that's a great idea. Um, I'll certainly think about it. Maybe maybe. I mean, my video production for this fall is pretty well set because I'm teaching all these classes that I need core concept videos for, you know, and I don't have Newman in the mix, um, but maybe in the spring would be would be possible. All right, let's find out where things were skipping around. Um, human evolution. Um, I'm going to take the second one because the translations of Epictetus, I don't have a favorite translation. I don't have favorite translations in general um, because I can, I, you know, things I can <clears throat> read in the original. I'm lazy. I go to the original, you know, whenever something seems kind of wonky. Um, but so, okay, which text of Cicero touch on Stoicism? Good question. Um, so if, it depends on what you're interested in. So if you're if you're looking for... Uh, Stoic Cosmology and Theology on the Nature of the Gods, book two. If you're looking for ethics, um, there's a real short work, which is called The Stoic Paradoxes, that you want to check out. Um, then there's um, On Duties, that were available in three books, which actually tells us a bit about controversies between different Stoic thinkers on issues like, you know, do you have to... Uh, reveal to the market that you know prices are going to go up or down or things like that based on on what's what's going on. Um, of course, there's on the ends. Uh, book three is is Cato presenting the Stoic philosophy, then Cicero critiquing the Stoic philosophy. Um, if you're interested in Stoic epistemology, you want to read the Academics. There's there's good bits of Stoic stuff in the On the Laws and On the Republic coming up as well. Um, I'm sure I'm forget. Oh, the how can I forget? Stoic theory of the emotions, uh, Stoic attitudes towards death and injuries and, and things like that. Tosculan disputations. Um, so you know that'll that'll take you quite a while to read through all of those sources. And I think I'm leaving something out, um, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head, unfortunately. So. Um, okay, so here's a here's a question that got flagged uh, for re review, and I'm going to show it. A uh, very funny question. <laughs> hey, Greg, this is from Robert Sims. Who are the biggest jerks you've had to deal with in your academic career in philosophy? The Hegelians, the Heideggerians, the Kantians, the Derridians, the Nietzscheans, etc. Um, I would say it wasn't any continental people, although you know. Some, some people who are like, so there, there was a time when Derrida was riding high and there was a lot of people who were Derridians and um, some of them were kind of jerks. The question that you want to ask is which philosophical movements and which thinkers and texts tend to, A, draw in the jerks who are already jerks and they're attracted to that? Nietzsche, I think, is, is, is somebody like that, right? Ayn Rand, great example, right? Um, plenty of people are like, I want to read that stuff that tells me I can tell everyone else to screw off, you know. Um, but then there's some that as they're they're doing it, they they kind of become jerks, right? And then there's also like communities of jerks. So I would say, you know, early in my career, it was the analytic philosophers because they were still kind of riding high um, at Southern Illinois University where I did my my graduate studies. Um, we had a pluralistic department, but it wasn't everybody all getting along in one big kumbaya moment. The analytics for years had tried to phase out the classical American and continental philosophers. So, um, you know, you, you often get this kind of, I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about, condescension coming from them. Um, analytics have gotten better 
in, in recent years. I mean, there's jerks. There's jerks everywhere, right? There's plenty of continental jerks too. But I don't see so much of a, a problem with, with them these days, um, in part because they don't even speak the same language you know, themselves. It's no longer really like a research program or closely connected research programs. It's just a way of doing philosophy, I think, for them. Um, I will say one thing, though. When I was at Southern Illinois University, the people that really got on my nerves the most were the Deweyans. And, and I still kind of, you know, again, that sort of like eye roll in the back of my head, when somebody starts bringing up Dewey and his pedagogical theory, I like American pragmatism. I like James. I like Peirce. I like Royce. Dewey, not so much. And, and there's something almost triumphalistic about Deweyans that tends to push me away. So um, there, there's that. And I, you know, I met quite a few jerks, just people who are personally jerks uh, in, in, in my, my years. But whether it's associated with a particular philosophical bent, um, that's that's a bit different. All right. Uh, er, Eat, Scrabble, Go says, I know it's been asked a thousand times, are you a practicing Catholic? Like, do you frequent the sacraments and attend Mass every Sunday? No, I, I don't. Um, I count myself a Catholic, but I, I go in frequently, and when I go, um, I'm usually not taking communion, but just, you know, regarding the host the way a lot, a lot of people did in the Middle Ages. Um, and, you know, I've got my own sort of struggles uh, that I have to <clears throat> work through, which I'm not going to lay out here. Um, I'll just say that there's there's many ways in which I'm, you know, I, I'm wrestling with, with God, you could say. Um, and I'm not quite quite finished with that yet. Um, I will say this too that I, you know, watching Catholic politics play itself out is an entirely unedifying spectacle. That doesn't keep me away, um, but it certainly doesn't bring me back. <laughs> you know? um, and I can see why it's such a scandal for for so many other people as well. But I'm but I'm certainly a part of the you could call it the Catholic intellectual tradition. And I do other things. I, I pray, you know. I read um, things along those lines. So, all right. Um, let's see who else we got here. Um, did I do Django before? Yeah, I did. Um, Brian, a is it? Aitchison, I have a lot of respect for Alistair McIntyre and wondered if you could talk more about the seminar you attended with him that talked about Lacan. Trying to understand Lacan more is <laughs> a tough road. Well, let me say something about the second part first, right? Yeah, Lacan is, is tough to understand. My advice for studying Lacan, don't go right into the Ecrate, right? Read some of the seminars first. Um, and I, I think a great place to start is the seminar on the ethics of psychoanalysis. Um, you can start with seminar one if you want, and seminar two, and that's good. The seminars are easier to understand because Lacan is in the process of actually teaching people <laughs> to some degree, right? Um, they're easier to understand, I think, than are the uh, the écrit. Lacan deliberately wrote in an obscure way. He's kind of a jerk when it comes down to it um, in terms of his his writing. He was often trying to stick it to the the psychoanalytic establishment. Um, by the ways in which he was writing, and he does all these plays on words. So, so if you're finding him difficult, no, no, you know, reason why you shouldn't. The other thing to keep in mind too is he's got all these like diagrams and graphs. Um, you could actually ignore that that stuff. I think a lot of the time, um, and and you know, still understand what he's talking about. Um, he made very unconventional use of mathematical and topographical symbols. Um, and if you're trying to interpret it in terms of like the systems that he's working from, it, it, it kind of screw, it'll, it'll make it difficult for you. Um, that said, you know, it's worth reading the AK. Oh, so let's go back to the McIntyre thing, right? So yeah, it was kind of interesting when, when I did it, I think it was 2005. So we're talking about 14 years ago. So I was a junior scholar. I graduated you know, with my PhD in 2002. And 
I don't know where I saw the call for applications, but I saw it. And it said, you know, Erasmus Institute Summer Fellowship at Notre Dame. At that time, I was living in Northwestern Indiana. So that would mean I could actually, you know, I, I, at that time, you know, my, my daughter was probably around three or so. <clears throat> so I didn't want to be gone too long. And um, I could drive there. So I applied for it. And the thing was, ration, it was, it was uh, um, practical rationality was the, the overarching theme. And McIntyre was doing his usual three thing, his usual uh, three comparison uh, thing where he goes like, here's tradition one, here's tradition two, here's tradition three. What do they have to say to each other? How can they learn from each other? So the first one that he picked was rational choice theory, which has its you know beginnings in a sort of anthropology that that he saw as coming out of Hobbes and Hume, uh, and then you know it's kind of a common way of, of adjudicating moral issues now. Then the second one was Aristotelian Thomism. So of course we're reading Aristotle and um, you know Thomas Aquinas, and the third one was Freud and Lacan. But he actually brought in quite a lot of um, object relations theory and and uh, was talking about people other than just Freud and Lacan. But that's a, a tradition as well. And McIntyre long had a, a grounding in that. You, you know, he's got a book, The Unconscious, right? Which he wrote, if you read the foreword, he wrote that while he's you know teaching a class on, on um, psychology that he got tasked with, with doing sort of out of the blue. So um, I was probably the most junior scholar there, and I got in in part because I actually had some background in all three of those paths, and I was teaching at Indiana State Prison. Turns out McIntyre wanted to talk with me about what prison teaching was like and what was going on with that. Um, most of the other people who were involved in the seminar were either well-versed in the Aristotelian Thomas tradition or they're well versed in um, the uh, uh, you know rational choice theory. There was a guy who's an economist there, writer on Smith, and then there were a few who like knew Thomism stuff to some degree, but also knew some continental stuff. <clears throat> so I I was there I think to to you know be somebody who could be a sounding board for that. The seminar was we we were given you know the reading list way ahead of time, and it included. Um, uh, some books on rational choice theory, some Hume stuff, some Hobbes stuff. Um, McIntyre ended up bringing in some Pascal as well, um, talking about you know the the, the wager and, and how you know we can do things that way in terms of like breaking down problems that way. And then of course Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, politics, Eudemian Ethics, um, large parts of Thomas Aquinas's works. Um, he used the Ralph McInerney, that big thick reader that's available. And then um, I don't remember what we had from Freud, uh, quite a few things. And then Lacan, uh, he recommended a key, um, Seminar 7, Ethics of Psychoanalysis, some secondary works as well. And each morning we would get together. Uh, what was cool is we, we, have, we all got put in the same dorm uh, at Notre Dame. So we're there for two weeks, very intensive. Um, we eat together, right, for breakfast. All of us, at, not McIntyre, he lives off campus. And then we meet in a room, and then from 9 to 12, we're there with McIntyre, and he's leading the seminar. Then, it, you know, we break for lunch, all eat lunch together. And then in the afternoon, from like 1 to 5, sometimes 6, um, it's us doing presentations and McIntyre giving feedback and all of us, you know, going back and forth about this stuff. And then at night, you know, we're, we're like either going out and hanging out together. In my case, I was actually at the library a lot doing research for my book on the Christian philosophy debates. Um, but, uh, and then I didn't stay the weekend. I actually went back home for the Saturday so I could see my, my, my daughter and then came back. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was good, and it was that way for both weeks. We and we each, we each had our project, and then after the seminar, um, we could have follow-ups with McIntyre if it was if he was available at the time, and and, and so I had some follow-ups with him. And why was he interested in Lacan? So, you know, like I pointed out, Freudianism, uh, the Freudian approach to things, 
is is a sort of tradition in moral philosophy. And if you strip aside the stuff like the Oedipus complex and all that, there's still something there. There's still something to the idea of doing ta talk therapy, understanding our unconscious motivations, um, having desires that we're not really privy to, figuring out how we would come to terms with them. And Lacan is, is really reacting against the Freudians of his own time who are getting into ego psychology and stuff like that. And he wants to say, we got to go back to Freud. And um, McIntyre was also interested in childhood development. This is, you know, the stuff that is, is you know, coming out of as well. Um, you know, his, his great big set of books is, you know, After Virtue, Who's Justice, Which Rationality, Three Rival Versions. That's often viewed as the trilogy. But then there's Dependent Rational Animals. And in there, he's talking about the virtues of acknowledge, acknowledged dependence. That's coming out of uh, psychological theory on his part. So he thinks that it's important to take that into account. Um, and, you know, McIntyre thought there was a great deal of nonsense in Lacan, <laughs> but there was also a lot of stuff that an Aristotelian Thomist would want to take on. And he's not unique in that. Um, uh, Leslie Koziak has a really wonderful article on Aristotle called On Being Properly Affected. Everybody should read it. Towards the end, Koziak says, um, or no, it's, a Co it's sorry, Kozman, Leslie Kozman, um, says, um, if we want to take Aristotelian theory further, we have to acknowledge that there's other ways of understanding the self and working on the self that we would need to connect up with virtue ethics, namely spiritual counseling and you know, something like psychoanalysis. Um, and I think that's part of what McIntyre was after in that, that seminar. All right. Um, Jesse Serka, who are our contemporary Ciceros? That depends on whether you're asking who's doing good eclectic philosophy or who are philosophers involved with um, our political crises and, and, and state and stuff like that. And it, it's important if we're going to say that somebody is a Cicero, they're not going to be a Johnny-come-lately um, person. They're going to have been within the political system for quite a while, moving up through through the ranks. I, I don't know. That, that's something I'd have to think about more. Um, people doing good um, eclectic work where they actually understand the traditions that they're drawing on and they're fusing together a greater synthesis. Um, I would say some of the thinkers who I mentioned earlier in this, this session, and, and I'd say Alistair McIntyre himself is doing that, that sort of thing. Robert Sims is... Charles Taylor is a secular age, 800-page tome worth reading. Do I think he's right in describing secularism and how the self is understood? It's been a while since I, I read it. Um, it's worth reading, yeah. I, I mean, in, in a book that long, you better find something that you don't agree with, right? Otherwise, I don't know, there's, there's, there's maybe a problem there if, if you can't find something that you... Uh, uh, you know, don't don't disagree with, um, but he's certainly giving you a lot to think about. So yeah, I would I would I would check it out. Um, Base profit. Hello, Professor Sadler. Do you think Hume is a non-cognitivist or a cognitivist, and what position do you hold? I'm not an ist, so um, I, I usually you know reject those sort of reductive titles, which usually come out of analytic philosophy, and they're like everybody fits into you know they're like these these things. But there are two kinds of people in life, right? Um, and it's sort of like, is Locke a rationalist or an, an empiricist? I don't know. If you read his work, he's actually both, right? Because there's a lot of rationalist elements. Um, you can't, like, truly be entirely a non-cognitivist when it comes to moral theory. Um, it, it, there's, there's a limit, you know, at, at a certain point. And it's, it, you have a problem with, with self-reflection. Um, I mean, Hume is definitely putting forth an, a, a, an ethics that has some important non-cognitivist parts to it, right? But he also thinks that you can, in fact, evaluate um, passions so long as they're not just passions, but involve something like judgments, you know? So he, he's, not, he's not totally that, but he is, he is important in that, that framework. Um, Derek Bowser, any good books or thinkers on the philosophy of perception? I've read William Fish. I don't know William Fish. Um, I mean, one of the classic phenomenological works is Merleau-Ponty, The Phenomenology of Perception. I, I like that. I'm working through that with a client. <clears throat> you know, Heidegger's Being in Time is about perception in part two. Um, 
but it's not something that I, I really work that much on. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not much of an epistemologist, you know, or theory of perception person. So I don't, I don't have a lot of great suggestions. Um, Quinn Pascal, do you have any advice, text recommendations on the art of memorization, especially for philosophy? I don't, because my, my path that I took was quite idiosyncratic. When I needed to memorize stuff, I made myself memorize stuff. I didn't use anybody's techniques or monomics or anything like that, but I, uh, you know, I was a different kind of, kind of person. For me, it's easier to understand and, and retain things if I understand the system that they're part of. So like when it came to, you know, um, when I was studying Greek, I didn't just memorize paradigms. I learned the linguistic laws by reading the grammars that the paradigms were an expression of, and then I would be able to sort of extrapolate from that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't I don't really have suggestions. Um, Gambrick, do I have any opinions on Terry Pinkard's translation of the phenomenology of spirit? Um, yeah, I'm glad he's got it out. Um, I've got an old version of it when he used to have drafts available where you've got the, the German and the English on facing pages, and that's awfully nice to have, isn't it? So you can actually check the stuff. Um, it's closer to the text than the Miller translation was, uh, let alone the Findlay translation, so it's an advance on, on it. Um, Miller has got kind of a, <clears throat> you know, it's been out there for so long, that it's, it's really still the standard text. And it's not like I'm going to shift it with the half hour Hegel series to using Pinkert's uh, version. But, um, you know, it's great that he put in the time to do it. I, I know how long translation projects take, you know, and translating a work like The Phenomenology of Spirit, man, that is, that is a lot to do. And it took him years and years and years and years. So, yeah. Uh, McGill Hernandez asks, um, what are my political alignments? <clears throat> so I am, you could say, non-aligned, but um, uh, rather, you know, critical. Um, right now, more critical of the right than the left. In the past, that's been, that's been the opposite. Um, and this, this particular administration and what they've done um, and, and, you know, living here in Wisconsin and seeing what the Republicans uh, did in, in our state, and, and not just that, but the motives behind it has uh, meant that, that practically speaking, I'm, I'm going to be supporting the, the left in, in, you know, coming elections. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a registered independent. I criticize people pretty routinely from, from all different sides. Um, because I'm a virtue ethicist, so that's my that's my political alignment. Unfortunately, um, due to the sort of you know metastasizing of of Trumpism on the right, uh, there's very few people who who meet any standards of virtue uh, left within the Republican Party or within their their coalitions. You look at evangelicals, you look at conservative Catholics, they've all had to like, you know, reconfigure their minds in such ways as to make themselves quite vicious. Plug that on left as well. But, you know, it's going to be voting for the, you know, the lesser evils in this case. Um, I, I guess you could say that in general, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, you, from an American perspective, a lot of the things that I endorse are, are considered leftist. From a European perspective, they're pretty centrist, like, say, protecting workers' rights, you know. Um, that's, you know, here in a lot of states, we have a, very little of that, but that's because our country's so screwed up. Um, I, you know, I <clears throat> look at a lot of the tiffs in between different constituencies, and I think, you know, I, I'm tempted to say a pox on all houses, but... Um, I can't do that because we have some really pressing issues before us um, that we need to deal with, like, for example, climate change. You know, we, we, have, we have one party that's still in complete denial about it and doesn't want to do anything, and if anything wants to turn things backwards in terms of protection for the environment or, you know, uh, initiatives that would move us away from a high dependence on fossil fuels. We have uh, a Democratic Party that's largely captive to corporate interests. 
Um, and then, you know, a lot of the people on, on, on the left are concerned about it, but they're concerned about it in the ways that wackos are. So, you know, what are you going to do? And we have no viable third parties, in part because of the way the system is set up here. Um, a third party can't get into the debates, barely can get on the ballot in, 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 in any, any meaningful way, can't develop organizations because both parties have colluded, in effect, to make that the case. Um, the gerrymandering that, that happens like here in Wisconsin, um, where we have a, you know, uh, Republican majority in, in the, uh, the legislature, even though Republicans are definitely not the majority and didn't get the majority of the votes, um, it doesn't just hurt Democrats, it hurts us independents and it hurts everybody else because it makes things inherently undemocratic. So I guess you could say my political alignments are I'd like to see shit torn down and replaced with much more democratic institutions. You know, and I'd love to see probably 90% of the current crop of politicians put out to pasture um, and gotten rid of. <clears throat> and I think the corruption um, and the, you know, uh, lobbying and all of the, you know, sort of backroom deals, I, I think those are, those are bad. But then again, like I said, I'm a virtue ethicist, right? So I'm probably going to be seen as a little bit unrealistic by, by many people. Um... All right. Original Bon Jovi, do you think the idea that God is imminent is coherent? It certainly strikes me as incompatible with classical metaphysics. I don't know which classical metaphysics we mean. Um, I mean, Thomas Aquinas was a classical metaphysician, and he certainly just seemed to think that God could be uh, do things, uh, you know, imminently, meaning in the world. Um, even, it's, there's even room for that in Descartes, I guess, in a way, right? So do I think the idea is, is coherent? it's coherent whether it it works or not you know when we get down to i, I don't know um it depends on what theory we're looking at natalie asks why does why do many people seem to have somewhat nihilistic perspective on life nowadays is the appeal of nihilism justifiable <clears throat> i don't know that more people today have a nihilistic perspective than in the past i mean i grew up in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and there were plenty of people who had a variety of nihilistic perspectives back then. You can also see it in the popular culture of the time. Um, and, and I don't think there's a reason why people are nihilists or adopt positions that, even though they don't, don't identify as nihilist, are turn out to be nihilist. I'd also say that <clears throat> at any given time, the... Um, a lot of people are, are, you know, buying into some sort of ism in such a way that it's really, it's really in a nihilistic way. You know, to go back to politics, I'll take two things from one from right and one from left. Um, if your if your practice of identity politics on the left is such that you are um, just sort of like trying to get, you know, uh, a charge out of being the victim, and um, you're you're you know, perfectly fine in your university dorm room and you go out and, 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 you know, be edgy here and there and then immediately talk about how you're, you're oppressed and nobody else can speak for you. You're probably a nihilist when it comes down to it because what you're believing in is kind of bullshit. I mean, this is, this is part of why like old left people like Marxists are like, what the hell is this crap? You know, um, on the right, you know, a lot, <clears throat> you know, we'll take another example. If you're an evangelical and you support Trump, you're a nihilist. <laughs> That's all there is to it, because what he is doing is so radically incompatible on so many levels with what the gospel actually preaches, that the cognitive dissonance going on in your head must be just, you know, at, at, at peak level. And you're, you're doing it either because you need to feel good or you hate the, the, those people over there or you need to, like, you know, tell yourself somehow that you're living up to a Christ who's going to, if you ever meet him, he's going to turn your back, his back on you and say that thing about, you know, did you, you know, clothe the naked, feed the hungry? No, you, 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 you spat on him instead and elected a guy who treated him like crap? Well, I'll see you later, right? There's nihilism available. Uh, underneath all sorts of stuff. And, and you could be a nihilist consumerist too. You could be a nice centrist and be like, I don't want to hear anybody. I just want to play my video games and enjoy myself and you know work, work the job that I've got or go to college and do the things that I'm going to do but not be bothered by anybody. <clears throat> That's nihilistic too. When you get down to it, what is nihilism? Nietzsche said it's the devaluation of the highest values. The ground sort of drops out. doesn't mean that people don't believe in anything. They believe in things that are bullshit. 
to get by, to, to allow themselves to feel good about themselves. So is there more of that today than there was in the past? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> Yasonis asks, can you explain Kant's argument for how human freedom makes the categorical imperative binding? Um, it's not that human freedom makes the categorical imperative binding. It's, um, it's not quite so direct as that. It's, you know, we can distinguish between different moral imperatives, right, or different possibilities of imperatives. And there you want to read groundwork um, for the metaphysics of morals because he discusses it in there. There's hypothetical imperatives, and those are, you know, those are like, well, if you want to be happy, then you should do this, right? Um, so you want to be happy, do this then. Right? Or if you want to heal a patient, do this. And Kant says, well, those can't really, um, those can't be truly moral imperatives. You need, you need something that could be universalized. That, there's the first formulation of the categorical imperative, right? Um, human freedom figures a little bit more into the second formulation, which is that we should you know, always treat humanity as an, as an end, never as a mere means. That means respecting other people as locuses of freedom, among other things. So respecting their autonomy, um, which is quite important. Um, but the, you know, it's not like there's a one-step thing from one to the other. So um, I think you want to to uh, look at the groundwork because that that's where you're going to find it discussed. All right, um, Mr. Stranger, here's a good question: What theory of truth do you subscribe to? I don't subscribe to one theory of truth. I subscribe to a whole bunch of them because I think they all need to be sort of combined. Again, I'm an eclectic, right? So I, you know, I think Heidegger's got some cool stuff to say about Aletheia. I think he's wrong in saying that it's the absolute, you know, foundation for all the things. I think that, you know, um, truth is revealed, as Hegel says, the truth of an idea is often revealed to us in how it plays itself out practically. I think there's something there. I think Anselm is on to something in his, his uh, book on truth, talking about truth in the will. Aristotle himself talks about theoretical and practical truth, right? Just go to Nicomachean and Ethics, book six, and you're going to find an interesting but underdetermined discussion of it there. So, and, and you know, I like, I like the pragmatists, you know. Um, I, I'm not a pragmatist, but they have something good to say. So what we have to do is put them, put them together, you know. Uh, P.B. Barnett uh, uh, suggests, um, how about a reading group that covers one text per month? It could meet online once a month to discuss the text. I'm sure it would get a lot of participation. Um, Right now, I'm teaching three classes this summer, that all of which have to be basically built from the ground up. I'm coming off of a semester where I taught five classes. I'm heading into another semester where I'm going to teach six classes. That's in addition to being the editor of Stoicism Today, giving roughly 20 free talks here in the Milwaukee area, and um, carrying on a whole bunch of other things and churning about 250 videos a year. So. I don't know that I have that much time for yet another thing. That's in addition to doing consulting work, work with my clients, you know. Um, so I, I don't know. I would, I would have to see. I mean, I do, I've done stuff like that in the past with my online classes that are available to the general public, um, but they're usually um, somebody's footing the bill, right? Um, it's, not, it's not just made absolutely free. I did, I did offer some online seminars monthly. Um, didn't get a lot of participation in them, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the videos for them are, you can easily see them. They're, they're there in, in a playlist. So I don't know. We'll, we'll think about it. Um, Jacqueline Chan, will you teach some Simone de Beauvoir in the future or other female philosophers? I did teach Simone de Beauvoir this summer, and I shot some videos on her. I haven't released the videos yet. So I'll be releasing those fairly soon. I, you know, when it comes to female philosophers, the ones that I routinely teach in my classes are de Beauvoir, Mary Wollstonecraft, who I'm a huge fan of. Um, sometimes I get to teach Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who, you know, is correspondent with Descartes. Um, I'll teach, you know, uh, ethics of care thinkers, late 20th century ones like Virginia Held, uh, Carol Gilligan, Rosemary Tong, Nell Noddings. Um, I also teach Hannah Arendt pretty frequently, um, and I even teach Ayn Rand. 
Um, a lot of people, ah, she's not a philosopher. She's a philosopher. She's just, you know, not highly regarded, right? Um, and, you know, I, I may end up, if I ever have the time, doing some work on, on Julia Annas' stuff because I, I think that she's, she's really, you know, a top-notch philosopher. Um, so, yeah, there'll be more stuff on, on female philosophers coming out in terms of videos. And um, I, I don't, you know, I may put online classes together. Wollstonecraft would be a natural one for me to do because I want to do some, some uh, academic work on her as well, some article writing. All right, uh, Alloy Cypher philosophers don't get enough credit for their badassery. <clears throat> so I have to ask you which philosopher's death was the most badass? Socrates was iconic, but I don't think it reached Cicero's. Well, for those of you who don't know, so Cicero participated in the, the Roman civil wars, and he fought on the losing side. So did Cato. Um, Cato killed himself. Cicero did not. Cicero comes back to, to Rome. And eventually, you know, once things break down with the second triumvirate, he gets, he gets caught and killed by um, partisans of Mark Antony. And they cut off his head and his hands and um, display them. Um, I don't know that that's super badass. Um, you know, it was, it was cool that he, he fought. Um, but, uh, yeah, who else? I mean, who comes to mind? I mean, some philosophers who were kind of badasses would be Descartes. Um, there's a famous story told about Descartes, you know, who fought, you know, he, he was perfectly fine with enlisting in, in the military. Um, he, uh, he was on a lake one time, and, you know, he, he's being rowed across it by these, these sailors, and he realizes that they intend to rob him and throw him overboard. So he pulls out his sword and holds him at sword point until they get him on the other, on the other shore, right? Um, and uh, that, that probably saved his life. Um, I mean, who else? There's, there's, there's probably plenty of people that we could, we could think of. Um, I don't know. I, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, Nathan Ormond, how do you justify your position as a Christian philosopher? I don't have to justify my position as a Christian philosopher any more than you have to justify your position as whatever it is that you are. Um, Miraj Adin Kande, best book for political philosophy. I don't know that there's a best book. Um, I would get yourself a good anthology that includes, you know, a lot of stuff along the way. Um, that that probably would be the thing to do. Um, I don't. I, I'm I'm kind of I'm not in favor of people who want to have just just the the one book. So um, let's see what else we got here. Um, Azrael, thoughts about Amartya Sen? He's quite influential in development and welfare economics, but here he's cited in philosophy too. Exactly. Yeah, he gets brought up in terms of ethics and political philosophy for this development perspective, which is building off of uh, his teacher, Rawls, but taking it much further. Um, he's well worth reading. And the, the discussions about you know, what, what contributes to and what constitutes human happiness, I think are worth reading as well. Sen is one of those people, unfortunately, who, because of the nature of classes, I'm always like, ah, I wish I could put some of that in there, but I can't. I, I don't have the, the time to, to teach it. Um, but, yeah, somebody who's well worth, worth checking out. All right. Um, Quinn Pascal, what subjects would you prescribe for a complete and comprehensive post high school education for a modern person? Do you think it's important for us to be knowledgeable in different fields? Yeah, you should know something about a lot of different fields. Um, I mean, philosophy, obviously, I think people should study philosophy, and I think they should study multiple branches of it, um, and not just get their stuff from Wikipedia or, you know, uh, short, glitzy, uh, YouTube videos, I won't name any names, but you guys all know who I'm talking about, uh, the things that are high production, low content. Um, communication is something people should study. And, and I think, you know, um, 
probably a, a study of the emotions and how they work, you know, so getting some degree of emotional intelligence, not something we really do much in, in school. Um, if you went to a crappy high school or you went to some place in a red state, you probably need some, some health classes that actually cover sex ed uh, because uh, I'm finding out from my own kids how, how terrible their education is in Indiana, which is a political matter, right? Um, you should learn basic finance. That, that's another really key thing, how the financial system works, you know, what's going to happen if you take out credit cards, learning how to budget, uh, those sorts of things. Everybody should probably also learn basic home ec, how to cook, you know, what goes on when you're cooking things, um, how to take the stuff in your refrigerator and turn it into a decent meal. And we could go on and on and on with, with examples of things that, that people should know that they're not generally being taught. Um, I think everybody should learn some foreign languages. I, I, think, it's, I think it's stupid to not do that, you know. Uh, maybe you pick the ones that are most marketable, like Spanish or Chinese, you know, Mandarin, of course. Although, you know, Cantonese could probably be, be good as well. Um, Mandarin will open more doors, or, though, uh, or, <clears throat> you know, other, other languages as well. Um, if you haven't learned much about music, even if you don't intend to be a musician, you should probably learn a little bit of music theory and some music history so you're not just listening to pop crap all the time and, and thinking that's really good. Um, say similar things about art education, you know, theater. Um, definitely should learn some, some study some history. Uh, it was really funny. I saw something on Twitter the other day where a historian, somebody who, te and somebody who teaches in college is like, sometimes I get these students who are like, why do they, we have to take a history class? We already learned all of our history in high school. And, you know, that's sort of like, what are you talking about? You know, what you got there was just the thinnest soil possible. Even if you take your required, you know, one or two history classes in, in college, you're only going this deep. You, you want to learn history? Uh, you got to do a lot more than, than that. Um, so, I mean, th th those would be kind of a start, I, I would say. Um, let's see. It just jumped a little bit. Um... Do, 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 do. Uh, Ally Cipher, thanks for the answer. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. Now I got to find where I was. Uh, every once in a while, the, the live chat thing, it'll just like suddenly scroll down like, you know, a million different things. So it's hard. And then there's all these side conversations going on at the same time. That are that are uh, tough to, to read as well. Um, man, where was I? Oh, here we go. Um, by by Ringen thirteen. What's a powerful argument you have against physicalism? I don't have arguments against physicalism. I I, I don't you know. I sort of just move through the the vast maze that I'm in without worrying so much about being a proponent of this, a proponent of that. You know, I, I'm doing enough with, with just teaching. I retro gamer, would you, in opinion, directly relate without a de detracting critique the concept of jouissance in Lacan being equivocal to the pragmatic outcomes of Epicurean values and facilitated growth of mind? So there's a lot of jargon there. That's tough to unpack. Um, so what is, what is jouissance for Lacan? So the French word, you know, it's kind of a play on words, right? Because jouir can mean to, to have an orgasm to come, right? Um, but jouissance is like enjoyment of things. And it's not it's not merely the, there's something beyond the pleasure. You could, you could also call it like satisfaction, right? Um, getting what it is that you, you want. And, and very often from a Lacanian perspective, you get what you want and then you realize this wasn't what I wanted. And, and sometimes people are telling you, you need to enjoy, right? That's another factor of the Lacanian thing. So now, being equivocal. Yeah, the concept is equivocal, or it's meaning that it, it, it takes on multiple meanings, right? It's, it's not something you can easily tie down. Equivocal to the pragmatic outcomes, so the payoffs of Epicurean values. Okay, so if you have Epicurean values... If I understand the, the question right, the Epicureans, 
stress, pleasure, and that you want to have a life full of what they called active pleasures or kinetic pleasures, you want to pursue the one, you want to pursue it rationally. So you don't want to just like immediately throw yourself into the big party, snort a line of Coke, you know, start slamming beers and sleep with the first person that you come across because that's liable to be a, a, a bad strategy in attaining pleasure. You know, you're going to wind up with a hangover and maybe a ticket and uh, an STD, and then you're not going to be real happy. <laughs> So, so you want to be rational in how you enjoy and consume and, and pursue those pleasures. But the Epicureans also stressed um, freedom from fear, trouble, pain. You want, and, they, and they thought that that state was actually more enjoyable, more pleasurable. And the Epicureans themselves get in trouble. Cicero nails them. He goes after them in book two of On the Ends for being um, – playing fast and loose with the word pleasure, voluptas in, in Latin, right? So um, that's, uh, that's part of what's going on. Now, how would Lacan look at that, right? Um, and, and how would he look at it in terms of jouissance? So if you're an Epicurean, like a classical Epicurean, you are, without calling it such, you're, you're, trying, you're being motivated by what Lacan is calling jouissance. There is one other thing, though. There's a kind of contingency to, to that for Lacan. And, and I think he's completely right about this, right? We often, you know, if we're being rational pleasure maximizers or pursuers, we think to ourselves, ah, this is going to get me the pleasure that I want. I, I'm projecting out a, a path ahead. This is what we call practical reasoning. And the Epicureans are very big on that. They said that you can't actually live a pleasant life without living a prudent and just and, and, and living well. Um, so the prudence part is is practical reason. But we often find, you know, this is part of the human condition, right? We do stuff and we're like, that isn't as pleasant as I thought. Or we do stuff and we're like, holy crap, this is great, right? And sometimes it's just that one time and sometimes we're able to reproduce it. We were able to make it happen again. Um, so I think that uh, that's probably about as much as I have to say about, about that right now. Uh, Ron Wagoner, have I read any Nicholas Berdyaev? I have. Uh, I've read his book on Dostoevsky, and I've read some of his other stuff, but it's been quite a while since I've read him. So, uh, Bill Soyles, what do you think of Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? It's a good book. Um, you know, it's, it's something that has some interesting parallels with existentialism and stoicism. Um, I actually knew a person who was super into logotherapy when I was an undergraduate, and um, he seemed fairly well adjusted. So, you know, uh, it, it's, it's certainly a, a popular book that's worth reading. Um, Spiro Katam Prower regarding the uses of the Tao to symbolize morality or the way, like at C.S. Lewis, do you know any other moral combos that the Tao could represent? I'm not sure what a moral combo is. So I'm not sure what you're asking there. Michael asks, uh, what else can you do with a PhD in philosophy other than be in the academy, though? Um, I mean, Google it. <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of articles about that. There's an entire field of people who are working outside of the academy, and there's blogs and you know, webcasts devoted to that. I've, I've been on some of those, those podcasts as a guest, so that's, that's what I think you can figure out. Um, Charles McLaughlin, is liberal Western civilization now in the pre-death emergency phase espoused by Spengler? With the emergent strongman authoritarian politics of Trump, Putin, and others would suggest we are. So here's what I'll say about that. Um, I don't buy Spengler myself. Um, Spengler, of course, could be right about things. If he is, then we live in a very impoverished world because Spengler is not a, you know, not a great mind. <laughs> so... Um, but you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really buy into that that theory that he's putting forward. I think it's kind of a cookie cutter approach to history. So, all right, um, let's see. Bill Olson asks about uh, Willem Flusser's towards the philosophy of photography. I've never never heard of him or read him. Um, let's see here. T. Dam League of Legends. Have I read any Jung? If so, what are my thoughts on him? And does his work any have any influence on philosophy? 
Um, Jung doesn't have much influence on philosophy, I would say. Um, and I was just talking about this the other day. There's, you know, there's Jungians still practicing out there. I think Jung has a much bigger effect on popular culture. I'm getting asked pretty routinely. I think it's because of the Peterson effect, because Peterson's a big Jungian, you know, what I think of the shadow and stuff like that. And yeah, I've read a lot of Jung, and I, I enjoy reading Jung, but I don't, I don't buy his archetype theory, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of like, you know, neat, you know, overcomings of dualism there that are a little bit too neat in, in the work. And I can see why it appeals to a lot of, a lot of people. Um, that said, I mean, Jungian analysis can sometimes help people. Um, psychotherapy, it's not like there's one single approach to psychotherapy that's good for everybody. Um, and, and, you know, Jung can be helpful with a good practitioner. Um, I like reading his books because he's a good stylist, but I, I don't, I don't really use Jung at all. Um, Abdul asks, can you translate philosophy without being a professor or expert? I'm studying French lit right now, and I'm interested in translation. I'm very interested in philosophy, but I'm just a layman. So it's not like an off-on switch where either yes or no, right? It's, it's more like a continuum. If you are translating anything, really, like if you wanted me to translate stuff about um, toilets and plumbing in, in French, I, I suppose I could do it but I wouldn't be very good at it. You'd probably do better to have somebody who knew both languages and actually understood the, the field. So it's, you know, it's gonna be helpful to know more, more about it. Um, the other thing to remember too is that when you get into authors, they often almost have their own little lexicon that takes you a while to get used to. So, all right. Um, Let's see, what do we got here that's new? Um, Derek Bowser asks, do I subscribe to a theory of aesthetics or have my own view? Um, I see these online re neo-reactionary types hammering the subject endlessly. Is it very important to our human experience? So I think maybe we're using the word aesthetics a little bit differently. They're probably, when, when they're hammering the subject, they're probably advocating, like, this is the aesthetic that we want, right? And this aesthetics is bad. Um, but aesthetics in general is more like, well, what, what actually constitutes beauty or the sublime or what's going on when we, when we call something art? Um, aesthetics isn't really my field. Kind of funny, since I teach at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. Um, and I suppose I should, you know, bone up on it more. I took classes on it, but I'm not, I'm not an expert on aesthetics. Um, and I can't say I have my own view because <laughs> I, I don't even know other people's views well enough to have my own view. So, yeah. All right. Um, David Divad77, how do you solve the Euthyphro dilemma? I talk about that in the video on it. Um, it's, not, it's not a dilemma if there's other possibilities, right? Um, it's only a dilemma if you if you decide that that it isn't one way to solve it is take one of the horns of the the dilemma right. Um, all right, let's see here. Oh, we got about ten minutes left to go in. Um, I'm going to take a pass, unfortunately, on on Mirak Ari's question about what Hegel's talking about when he uses expression of force and force that's reflected on itself, concepts in the phenomenology. Um, force in the understanding is the most difficult part of the phenomenology of spirit, one of the most difficult works of philosophy. I'm not sure which video you're, you're referencing, and I don't have, certainly don't have the time to like go in and start you know, looking at the, the videos. So um, that's that's something. Maybe you know I'm, I'm doing half-hour Hegel every month. I do like a uh, Q and A and discussion session. So you might want to get in on that. Um, you can find you can find that on my Reason IO website, if going to the calendar or by looking at the Facebook page. Let's see what else we can do. Nathan asks, "How do you deal with the new atheism skeptical movement, which is quite popular on YouTube with many skeptics now studying philosophy at prestigious universities?" I don't think it's new. New atheism has been around now for a couple decades. Um, I've never taken it all that seriously because it's mostly been bad argumentation and tendentious. Um, 
you know, the skeptical movement. Skeptic can mean a million different things. Some skeptics are cool and you can work with them. Some skeptics are complete jerks, you know, and are like the debate me bro, you know, sort of thing. And they're just not worth my time. Um, I will have to take it for granted that there's many of them now studying philosophy at prestigious universities. I don't care about prestigious universities. Uh, if, you know, if you know me at all, you know that I think that you can do philosophy just as well uh, at a you know, low tier university as you can at a, a high tier university. Um, I think that you know, from my own experience, everybody puts their pants on you know, the same way, one leg at a time even if you have a valet to do it for you. you know? So um, I'm not impressed by, by prestige and it doesn't strike me as a major issue. Um, let's see. A lot of back and forth going on here. Um, Uh, some of these, it's hard to tell whether they're questions for me or people asking each other questions. <laughs> um, mm, okay, here's an interesting one from long, long-term uh, uh, participant uh, whose name I always screw up, Mies Mistinen. <clears throat> Can we construct new conceptual frameworks for people to construct a census communis, that's common sense, right, uh, a sort of agreed upon basis? Uh, that could help us with climate crisis. That is, that is the concept of limitation to our everyday consciousness. We could, but we wouldn't be able to get a lot of people who need to be on board on board. Uh, I think that that's a good question. Though. Could we form? Could we form a consensus? So it's not just like all these different groups that don't agree with each other. Can we arrive at the point where we're like? Man, we better do something about climate because we're we're getting ourselves into deep territory. Whatever degree it's man, you know, human caused, we're really contributing a lot to our our problems that that future generations are going to face. Uh, and maybe we're going to make the, the earth uninhabitable for ex just a small pocket of of humans, uh, which seems to be a terrible idea. Um, yeah, I mean, we could. We, but but it's it's so difficult to get people out of their current mindsets, and not just on the right. I mean, the right bears way more responsibility, particularly here in America, where they they you know have staked out stupid, irrational positions from a sort of human race perspective. Um, and you know, if if history if we have a history later, we're going to look back and we're going to be like, man, half the population were dummies you know, intransigent dummies. But there's plenty of problems on the left, too. I mean, you're not doing anybody any favors by getting into weird, you know, new agey conspiracy theory stuff about, you know, the, the planet being alive or, you know, uh, mankind uh, doing this or that. That's, that's so, so terrible. We have to have some very, very pragmatic solutions to this. And I don't know how to, how to provide it. So, but it's a great question. Um... Aaron asks, is it beneficial to you if you break down philosophical concepts into their logical functions like a bare bones representation? Um, yes and no. Yes, if, if they're amenable to that. No, if doing so leaves out so much that your bare bones representation no longer has anything remotely like what's actually being presented. Great example of that that I mentioned at the beginning. All these reconstructions that people do of, you know, what was Anselm's argument really about, right? It's there in the text. Read the Proslogion. Also read the Monologion, right? Read the other works as well. But, um, you know, um, the, the reconstructions that I've seen almost always deviate in some way. Sometimes they're bringing something in. Sometimes they're just too reductionist. So those are two ways you can, you can go wrong in doing that. And, and it's good to remember, too, that a lot of the available material out there on philosophers that you're going to get through popular internet sources or philosophy textbooks is is of that reductive like i'm going to make it bare bones for you so think about like aristotle's nicomachean ethics and the function argument i mean if aristotle wanted to give you a the function argument he would have done it right he wouldn't have written all that other stuff surrounding the passages that that they focus on so that other stuff is important 
Um, all right, let's see here. Fist spirit wants to be challenging. Non-aligned equals fascist. I guess maybe for you, there's plenty of ways to be non-aligned that aren't fascist. And I would distrust the mentality of anybody who can have an equal sign and fascist. So you kind of outed yourself here. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 scrolling down. Oh, there's an interesting question from, from Owen about pedagogy. Uh, do I think students should have more or less module choice at undergrad philosophy? Meaning, I, I'm guessing, should they be able to decide what undergrad philosophy classes they want to take? And we're not just talking about majors, right? Because they, they have choices about what they want to take. But should, like, students who are non-majors who have to take some philosophy classes, should they get a choice about that? Or should it be dictated, you're taking critical thinking, buddy, or you're taking intro and ethics or something like that? Um, I think that, you know, it depends on the, in, the educational institution. It could be quite good for them to be, to have a choice, but it should be a fairly narrow range of choices. You don't want students like jumping into a 400 level class with no background whatsoever. Then again, simply taking intro to philosophy, which is usually a prereq for those upper level classes, often, depending on who the instructor is, might not be all that, that helpful. So... All right, let me see if I can find some other people who I haven't already answered that have some, some good, uh, easy to answer questions. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, just skip down a bit, so. Oh, so here's here's a good good uh, question. At Cohen eleven, have you read C. Kevin Rose, One True Life: The Stoics and Early Christians as Rival Traditions? If so, what do you think of his thesis that their differences are irreconcilable? I haven't read it. Got it on my shelf. It's there. I got sent a, a copy to review, but I'm familiar with the thesis. And it depends on what we mean by differences are irreconcilable. If we want to say all differences are irreconcilable, that's bullshit. I mean, all we got to do is actually read early Christian thinkers and see that that's not the case because they talked about the Stoics, right? And some of them said, oh, the Stoics are right about this. And you can look at, you know, others who, who used um, appropriated Stoic techniques. If you're saying that on, on at some points there's going to be some ways where the Stoics go this way and Christians go this way, yeah. I mean, that's the way it is with pretty much every rival philosophical tradition. You could say the same thing about the Aristotelians and the Stoics. Uh, there's some things where the Aristotelians and the Stoics are actually on the same page. Some where they're marginally different from each other, but in conversation. Some where one's going this way and one's going this way. That is the nature of traditions. Sometimes you got to pick and choose. You can't put everybody always on the same page and, and pretend, you know, in a new age way that we're all doing the same thing, man. Um, so I don't know. Um, I'll, I'm certainly looking forward to reading the book uh, when I can find the time, but um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me pick one more question, and then we're gonna we're gonna come to an end with that. Um, do, 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 do. Let me scroll down a little bit. Um, There are a lot of repeats of questions in here that people are uh, doing again. Um, well, so there's a question that, that's asked here about Camus. Um, and the question itself, okay, who can we read as an opposite opinion to Camus or whoever criticizing Camus? I mean... Other uh, people who are in the existentialist spectrum. I know I, Camus says he's not an existentialist. He is an existentialist. He's just using the word existentialism more narrowly. Um, you know, Gabriel Marcel, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre. They're, they're not all in total agreement about things. Um, 
Who else would you read criticizing Camus? Um, it depends on why you're 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 why you're trying to find criticisms. I mean, you could easily find people saying the standard line, he's not much of a philosopher, he's more of a moralist or a novelist, which I think is crap, actually, quite frankly. But his style certainly is rather opaque in, in many accounts. Um, I actually, I, I like Camus quite a bit. I'm, I'm much more attracted to his political position than I am many of the other existentialist writers. Um, you know, what he articulates in, in, in The Rebel, I think is well worth taking into account. Letters to a German friend. Um, but if you want to criticize him, you know, I would I would look to other people in that, that same time and, and spectrum. Um, so we're almost, we're, well, we're really actually out of time and I have to do some class prep because I'm teaching all sorts of stuff. But let's see if there's anything else I could knock out very uh, quickly. Um, to finish up with. Uh, wow, some people have a lot of very esoteric things that they're asking about here. I know, I'll just, I'll just wrap it up. Um, I, I do have to get going. I have to build more content for this business ethics class that I'm currently teaching uh, and, and get cracking on content for a class that I'll be teaching for prisoners in the fall, which has to be completely ready to roll as an online class when classes begin. So I'll say thanks. Um, we'll be doing some philosophy pop-ups later in the month. There's also the half hour Hegel um, question answer and discussion session, as I mentioned. And I've got another um, uh, studying philosophy independently, Sadler's advice video coming out, provided I get a shot uh, over this coming week, next Saturday. Uh, on Epicurean philosophy. So if you're kind of a fan of that or wanted to get into that, you might want to check that out. Thanks to everybody who asked questions. Uh, obviously, I didn't get to all of them, but we never do. So hope you have a great day uh, wherever you happen to be in the world. Uh, good morning to you or afternoon or evening or night or whatever it is. So I'll see all of you in the ether. <laughs>